Hello, everyone. Today we have a lecture on transformers. Uh, will be a sequence of several lectures together. I will start sharing my screen. Just a minute. And current slides here. Let Morgan let me organize my pointer. Thank you. Uh, we use transformers. And the idea of transformers will be discussed in this uh, lecture and the next few ones. Um, a transformer could be uh, approached by looking to the idea of two coils. You know that by the laws of the uh, magnetic flux induction, if you have a coil and you have a current in that coil and the current is varying, then you have a current variation and then you have a voltage variation. So if your coil is, uh, doesn't have a core, it's in the air, you have a flux that goes in the air and closes in the air. And probably you learned this in physics that you have uh, some laws of induction. There are several, okay? Faraday's laws, Lane's laws, but I will try to approach more on the electrical engineer perspective and less on the physics perspective. Let's uh, assume that we have two coils. Here we have, there's a coil here, oh, number one, there's a coil here, number two, and we have here some terminology that are, are kind of uh, related to a transformer. Let's say that one coil here we call primary port. Why primary port? Because we have a voltage source connect to that particular coil. And then we have a secondary coil. If you imagine this in the air, you could maybe think that you may have a coil. Let's grab something. We have a coil, okay? And then you connect a voltage. There is a variation, there is flux, okay? Then you have another coil. So the position of those coils, you make that some of these flux lines here will be intercepted by this coil. So there is a kind of coupling. That coupling defines a mutual relationship because even though the second coil has no voltage connected, nothing connected, you can still measure a voltage with a voltmeter that depends on how many flux lines are interacting on the second coil coming from the first coil. We call that uh, magnetically coupled uh, circuit. And that means the flux on coil number one will induce a voltage on coil number two because some of the flux lines are captured by the second coil. So the number of the flux lines that are captured on the, on the second coil divided by the, number, the total number of the flux lines of the first coil is a number from zero to one. We call it uh, uh, coupling coefficient. We call it, call it K. And that K, it's a number from zero to one, will be related to the self-inductance of the first coil and the self-inductance of the second coil. And there is a magnetic uh, modeling that we could do it that will make uh, this uh, relationship to be proportional to the square root 
of the first inductance multiplying by the second inductance. We call that mutual inductance. So in a system like this, we could define three parameters initially. There is a coil or let's say initially an inductor because a coil is an inductor. So there is a certain inductance here we call self inductance. Okay, so if I have one in inductor by itself and there is no second one, if I apply a voltage across the, the, the coil and I have a variation, we know that V is L di dt. And in that case, because I'm applying a voltage to an inductance by itself, that amount of inductance is the self inductance. So this could be the same for the second coil if the second coil is not interacting with the first coil. Now, if I have DN interacting and I apply a voltage variation on the first coil and I observe a voltage variation on the second coil, there is a mutual inductance. There is, that means there is a, a, a variation on the second coil that depends on the first coil. And the reverse is the same. If I apply a voltage on the second coil and I measure on the first coil, I have a variation because uh, circuits are typically symmetrical and we assume all the magnetic uh, properties to be homogeneous. The mutual inductance from one coil to another one is the same one from that coil to the first one. Here we have um, uh, a diagram that helps us to define equations when we have mutual inductance. For that particular definition, we have to see if the voltage on one coil is, I would say, in phase with the voltage on the other coil. So we use a dot, okay? So the dot means when voltage is going positive here on this terminal, it's going positive on that terminal. So the dot is like a polarity, okay? And why the dot is important? Because uh, if you have a coil and you start winding that coil in one direction, okay? So imagine that I have here a volume that I'm going to have one turn, second turn, and I start winding my coil, okay? So there is a direction of the winding. So if you look to that, could be clockwise. If you have another coil and the coil is wound in the same direction, then the dot on the first uh, terminal is the same as the dot in the second terminal because they are wound the same direction. However, if one is winding goes clockwise and another winding goes counterclockwise, then the flux are reversed. So this is a, a little bit uh, relevant to construction of the windings. And if you take a, a wire and wire and you make a, a coil, you have to know exactly which direction you're doing to be sure of the polarity of the voltage. In, in this course, we try to approximate this in a more uh, how to say simple way. We just look to the dot. And when you see the dot here, we understand the polarities. For example, look to this one here. If the voltage is going to the positive cycle here, it's going to the positive cycle here on the other terminal. So if you look here, this would be negative compared to that one. So there is an inversion. We assume to be 180 degrees phase shift because uh, everything is symmetrical and well behaved, okay? So there are several combinations and depending on the combination, we could say this, if I apply a voltage here and the dots are aligned, then the mutual will be positive. That means in phase with that one. If the dots are misaligned, 
then the mutual will give you a voltage that's negative. So the coupling of one inductor to another one will depend on how the windings have been constructed, if they have been both on the same uh, clockwise or counterclockwise construction. But we pretty much uh, look to the dots and we say that the mutual effect of one port to another port will be negative if the dots are opposed, okay? Why this is this important? Look to the right here. Because when you write KVL and KCL for a transformer where you have the self-inductance and the mutual, you have to write in a way that you consider the dots. For example, let's look to the first circuit here, okay? Because this is not the same as the bottom one. Why? See, dot, 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 no dot. So let's look to the top circuit. If I do KVL here, I have minus VS1 plus R1 plus the voltage on the self-inductance, which is L di1 dt. And I have to add the mutual from the other side. Because this is dot dot, is m di2 dt. So you look that i2 will give you an influence on the circuit on this side. The same is for this side. If I do KVL here, I have minus VS1 plus R2 I, I2 plus the self-inductance, which is L2 DI2 D2. And because I have a dot, I have plus mutual inductance multiplied by the variation of current on the other side. The circuit on the bottom is similar but the mutual will give you a negative voltage. See, where I had plus MDI2 dt, now I have minus MDI2 dt because the dots are misaligned, okay? So the variation of current on the right side will reflect in a voltage here given by the mutual multiplied by the derivative of that current. But there is a negative here because I have dot, no dot. If I come here and I compare to the previous one, you see that I have minus and I used to have plus for the very same reason. The current on port number one, the variation of that current on port number one, di1 dt, will be multiplied by the mutual and I have a negative here because I have a phase reversal of the dots, okay? So when you have a problem with a transformer and you have self-inductance and the mutual inductance, you have to use a KVL on the primary side and a KVL on the secondary side and you have to use the self-inductance, they are always positive, and the mutual inductance will be positive if the dots are the same, and negative if the dots are reversed, okay? How we make a transformer? We make a transformer by coupling inductors on the same core. So this would be a transformer. Uh, this kind of transformer is not the one typically used for power conversion, but still is a transformer. If I have a, a magnetic uh, material here, and this is a cylindrical material, it's a rod, okay? It's a cylindrical core. And I have, uh, see, I have the winding coming from this, going to the other side and coming back, okay? Now you look here that here it comes like this, it's reversed, isn't it? 
So the mucho here, you have to be careful because one is uh, wound in a way that the turn starts from the front and another one, the turn starts from the back. So they are reversed, okay? This kind of cylindrical core is uh, only used for high frequency applications, um, telecommunications, antennas, uh, circuits that uh, uh, may propagate or may work on the megahertz. But typically for power conversion and electricity distribution, we have a material that is completely closed. See, there is no air. Here we have air closing. And here we have uh, the magnetic flux contained inside of the whole uh, core. So this is a rectangular core. There are other types of core. There, are, there is an E core. Just imagine E core. One, two, three, and a leg here. So E and another E, okay? So we have a bobbin here, another bobbin here, for example, okay? Or a coil. So there are several ways to, to proceed with the construction of a, a power transformer. But pretty much we could uh, assume that in this class, and to understand ideal transformers, we are going to use this kind of construction. Uh, a transformer is an electrical device. It still is a passive device. For example, resistors are passive devices, inductors and capacitors are passive device. In a transformer, we could uh, say that's a passive device where we use two inductors coupled in the same core. Uh, we can uh, define ideal transformers. I will give you a definition in the next slide, or maybe in two slides. But transformers are very useful for power circuits. They allow you to take AC voltage and step up or step down. And this would facilitate uh, for example, transmission, distribution, and consumption of electrical power. Why that's important? Uh, if you have a power plant and the power plant is very far from a city or an urban area, uh, the electricity is made uh, hundreds of miles uh, far from that urban center. So we have a power plant, the power plant has uh, a turbine, typically the turbine will be moved by uh, something that uh, has energy from fossil fuel, let's say. So you have fossil fuel, the fossil fuel will heat uh, water, the water you provide uh, steam, the steam is super, super hot. So you have a lot of energy in that steam. So that steam goes through a uh, blades of a turbine and then you move the turbine and the turbine will move uh, an electrical machine. The electrical machine will be an AC machine. So typically it's a three-phase machine for most of the applications, a three-phase AC machine could be a synchronous generator, could be uh, an induction generator. But what you have is uh, you move the shaft and at the three terminals of the machine, you produce three voltages that are phase shift by each other. Typically they are phase shift by 120 degrees. So a uh, three phase uh, electrical generator, you have voltage VA, VB and VC, and they will be given by equations like this. VA is amplitude multiplied by cosine of omega T. If uh, it's 60 Hertz, Omega is 2 pi 60, that means 377. And the magnitude will be uh, defined by the machine. A machine will typically provide a voltage on the order of a few kilovolts. Uh, let's say for 
4,800 volts RMS, okay? Could be other, could be 6.9 kV, could be 2.5 kV, depends on the machine. Then you have VA, VB, VC. VB will be the same amplitude, cosine of omega T minus 120 degree, degrees. And VC will be same amplitude, cosine of omega T minus 240 degrees or same as plus 120, deg 120 degrees. What does that mean? That means if you take those voltages and you sketch or you use an oscilloscope, you're gonna see a sign and then the next one is a sign delayed by 120 degrees. And the other one is a sign delayed by 240 degrees or starting 120 degrees before, okay? And you have a beautiful three-phase symmetrical and balanced AC system. We'll, we'll be discussing that. So the machine that generates such power gives you a voltage that's not very high. It's, uh, let's say, 6 kV, 6,000 volts. But 6,000 volts is still not very high for transmission. Because if your machine is made for, um, I don't know, a few megawatts, then the amount of current will be very big, very high. So what you do, we take a transformer, step up the voltage to uh, 200 kV, 220 kV something like that, depends on the utility. Because the power is supposed to be the same as you, uh, as you have a higher voltage, you're gonna have a lower current. So the transmission line will have a current through the copper of the transmission line that will be uh, decreased because there was a substation that step up the voltage. So you don't have a lot of losses because a loss in a in a in a uh, copper wire will be proportional to the square of the current, R I square. Okay, so that power will travel hundreds of miles and then will come to another substation. A substation is a transformer that you step down, and then you have a distribution and maybe close to the point of use we have other smaller transformers that will step down to our final use. And eventually you have in your house or in your office or anywhere you work, uh, an outlet with 120 volts RMS uh, of that uh, 60 Hertz sinusoidal voltage waveform. 120 volts RMS means that the sign has a peak of 120 multiplied by square root of two, okay? So we use transformers to facilitate transmission, distribution, consumption of electrical power. And we use uh, circuits that are connected in a core and that makes a transformer and we decide we define an ideal transformer by simplifying the, the equivalent model okay the next slide pretty much discuss what i have been talking but uh, close to our uh, to our home i would say if you have a power line and the power line brings you 4,800 volts. You may have a transformer in your house. The transformer might be shared by a group of houses, typically four. And we step down from this uh, uh, distribution to uh, a circuit that has 120 volts RMS, then a center tap and 120 volts RMS. So you, you may have two circuits of 120 from each side of the terminal, or you may have 240 for a higher voltage. For example, here in a residence, you see that you may have TVs and computers and anything you, you, you connect to 120 volts. But if you connect from the two lines here, you may have some appliances that will be uh, supplied for, uh, with 240 volts, maybe a stove, maybe um, 
drying machine, okay, 240 volts would be useful for those particular appliances because they are higher power in rating. So we want to use 240 volts instead of only 20 uh, in order to make sure that the connections and the wiring will not be very, very thick, okay? Going to the next uh, slide. Uh, is a little bit similar to the previous one, but there is a, a, a bullet here that's important. Transformers can also be used for impedance matching. When I we connect a transformer, the primary to the secondary, there is a relationship that makes the impedance on the secondary to be reflect on the primary in a way that depends on the turns ratio. So that makes possible for matching impedance. And in order to discuss that, you have to remember the discussion we had in DC circuits for equivalent tabernacle, when you have a resistance matching of your load with the internal resistance of your equivalent Thevenin RTH, you have the maximum power. This is the same when we have AC circuits. We, we don't have time to work too much on these uh, problems in this uh, course, but the idea is similar. If I have an equivalent Thevenin, the equivalent Thevenin AC has a phasor voltage and an impedance, the impedance has a real part and an imaginary part. I'm going to connect a load. So the load will be the maximum power transference when the, the imaginary part of the ZTH is zeroed by the imaginary part of the load. So we have to have the complex conjugate. And the real part of the ZTH should be equal to the real part of your load. So uh, transformer will help you to have this impedance matching. We have some problems here that discuss uh, impedance matching. We cannot work too much on Thevenin, but I will show you at, uh, towards the end of this uh, lecture series how to use it. Uh, the next three slides are very important. After that, I will uh, stop the lecture today and we'll continue on Wednesday. Uh, the properties of an ideal transformer, well, why it's ideal? Because we try to not uh, model too much what's inside of the transformer. What's inside of the transformer? Well, first I have a winding. The winding goes into a magnetic core. So the magnetic core has losses. The winding has losses, There's a, there is a resistance. Uh, it's not perfect, the mutual, so there is always some leakage to the air. There is some capacitance from turn to turn. So uh, a transformer is way more complicated than the ideal one. But when you use the, the, the ideal transformer, we can make some calculations that help us to define many things. The first thing you have to to assume is uh, what properties you make it ideal. The coefficient of coupling, we're going to assume that the coefficient of coupling is one, it's totally coupled, okay? Um, then we have the self-inductance L1, the self-inductance L2, the mutual inductance, the number of turns N1, the number of turns N2. Okay. We assume also that we do not have losses. So the transformer will take all the power on the primary side and convert to the secondary side. There is no heating, no losses. Of course, this is not uh, the reality. It's an idealization, but that's why, why you call it an ideal transformer. And what's very important is this one here, the voltage ratio primary to the secondary is proportional to the number of turns ratio primary to the secondary. See, here we have V2 to N2, V1 to N1. I prefer V2 divided by V1 is equal to N2 divided by N1. 
So that means the secondary voltage divided by the primary voltage is given by the number of the terms on the secondary divided by, divided by the number of the terms on the primary. It's uh, directly proportional. We can also call uh, discuss about the ampere terms. And the ampere terms is the number of terms multiplied by the current. I1N1 is equal to I2N2. So you can make a similar rule like the other one. I1 divided by I2 is N2 divided by N1, which is inversely proportional. The next slide talks about the power. Power is balanced, okay? Power on the primary side is V1 multiplied by one because there are no losses. We can say that's the same as V2 multiplied by I2. And here I'm combining the two dis discussions before. This uh, box here is the most important one for an ideal transformer. V1 divided by V2 is directly proportional to and one divided by any two, which is inversely proportional to the current. I two divided by a one is N one divided by any two. So this uh, relationship here defines the relationships of voltage and current in the primary and the secondary, given the turns ratio, assuming that the system uh, doesn't have any loss the power will be balanced, okay? So the turns ratio typically define the transformer. We could say, for example, I have N1 500 turns and N2 2500 turns. So that means the voltage here will be a certain voltage and the voltage here will be bigger, will be higher, why? because I have more turns on the secondary side. The transformer could either step up or step down, it doesn't matter. And the transformer is bidirectional. When you have a primary and a secondary, you can reverse. And if it was stepping up one way, if you reverse, it steps down, okay? So one way is to define the number of turns. Another way is to have a common denominator. For example, I could divide this by 500, so this is one to five. So you could either use the total number of turns or you could use a, a ratio. The ratio could be one on the primary side. The ratio could be one on the secondary side. So all of these are typical ways to define the same transformer. And here is an example. So my suggestion for you is to study this slide with this example with the mutual inductance. And then there's a problem where we apply the idea of an ideal transformer to solve it. So I'm gonna work this on the next lecture. And my suggestion is please do review this class, do review this lecture, understand the, the main relationships of uh, ideal transformers and try to work on your own for the mutual inductance. It's already solved in the slide and uh, try to work on the other circuits that we have the ideal transformer, okay? If you have any question, let me know. I will stop recording now. Stop.